Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me, as usual, is uh, Rob Hirschfeld. Hey, Rob. Hey, Stephen. And uh, just to give a little picture for the guests, you know, Rob's down in Austin, but he's got the heaviest sweater I've ever seen on for this podcast recording. I'm in the snow in Idaho in a t-shirt, so uh, I'm not sure if that means something. It's cold here. (laughs) Well, we have a warm weather guest with us, and uh, I'm very excited because there's a couple interesting questions I already want to ask. We have Justin Garrison, who is the author of Cloud Native Infrastructure, and it's cnibook.info, and we'll put more information about that. But uh, Justin, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Glad to so, be here. Just, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, glad to be here. Okay. Uh, Rob and I have taught quite a few uh, different conferences. Well, great. Yeah. Thank, thanks for joining. And so before we kick into all sorts of topics, we usually like our guests to just kind of give us a short background of, uh, of yourself and where you come from, your experiences, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm an engineer. Uh, I, I've been heavily involved in open source communities for quite a while now, um, which is interesting looking back because it's been over a decade now that I kind of started going to being involved in open source and uh, last couple of years really got involved in Kubernetes uh, community and uh, with that the uh, cloud native infrastructure or cloud native computing foundation the CNCF and kind of looking at a lot of their projects and and doing more and more just in those communities and, and trying out things and giving feedback. And uh, through that was kind of recommended to uh, write the cloud native infrastructure book a couple, almost a couple, two years ago. Um, and then all of last year kind of worked on that book with my co-author, Chris Nova. Um, we, we both tackled that with uh, go, figuring out how to write a book, what, what it means to write a book. It was an O'Reilly book, which means it's, you know, it's, it's got to be really good. And, and there's a lot of things that went with that. And so we just kind of iterated on, you know, what we wanted in it and, and how, how we wanted to present that information for someone that's trying to learn and get involved in the space. And you had done a podcast with the Tech Village podcast in go, where you spent a lot of time going through that process. I highly recommend um, people listen to that. It's a great podcast in general, but I, I think you did a really nice job laying out your thought processes and why and some things like that for the book. So that's, I would, I would recommend that podcast as a sort of a background for, for, for how this and how, how you did it and, and some of the, some of Chris's information too uh, for that. Did you, um, Stephen, did you want to, did you want Justin to explain the, the animal yeah, on the cover? Let, let's do uh, it. We have no, we have no choice. So, you know, the cover has this bird, and, and um, I already asked Justin three things. So you said it's an Andean condor? Yes. Uh, so originally when we were setting out to write the book, the very first thing the editor told us was, no, you're not allowed to pick your animal. Uh, the editors aren't allowed, and, and they also said there are, they're not allowed to put uh, uh, unicorns or T-Rexes on the cover. So both of those yeah, were Chris allowed. has got to be frustrated about uh, that, yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, I was a little bummed myself. And... Um, but yeah, so we were assigned this Andean condor, and, and the first thing I did was like, that thing looks crazy. I don't know what that is, and, and looked it up on you know Wikipedia, and, and sure enough, it's the uh, it's the largest by mass flying bird, and and because it's a condor, it's a, a vulture, um, so it, it feeds on the dead flesh of other animals, and and it just seemed very fitting for how we get infrastructure into a cloud environment. <laughs> love, love. Ah. <laughs> uh. The dead flesh idea for infrastructure has me a little trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but one more question on the bird that I'll, I'll let Rob go is, so is there someone at O'Reilly who actually decides the animals? I mean, that's a job to apply for? Or is uh, they do it as kind of a company thing? I know they have a, a internal list of animals that they've approved with artwork and that kind of stuff. And I okay. don't know if they theme the animals. And the, the book colors are themed depending on what type of book it is uh but the animals themselves i don't know if there's a theme but there is an internal list that they have that they just someone selects them i have no idea and and one of the first things we actually chris and i did the whole book through uh like git repo so we had pull requests on it and the very one of the first tickets we opened or pr we opened or issue was to name the bird because we're like well this bird needs a name and and we ended up calling it andy o'connor just because it seemed like and being nice. an Andean condor, it's like, oh, this, this works. I like so, that. Yeah. I like it. So the bird's name is Andy. <laughs> Needs a tartan. <laughs> uh, so, so why is infrastructure the dead carcasses that you feed on? What, <laughs> I, I want to pivot into cloud. What is cloud-native infrastructure? <laughs> why is infrastructure the carcass? Uh, 
to well some of the stuff we lay out in the book is is just you know defining a lot of that kind of stuff but but from my like thought process of, of why that's a dead carcass there's a lot of practices and things need to die in order to be cloud native like you can't just lift and shift does not make you cloud native. like you're, you're not going to get benefits by just converting vms and, and doing the same processes with the same uh, checklists and all these things by doing it amazon that's not cloud native that's renting server time from someone else so wow and I think that's a really profound thing, right? We were saying that it, it's not enough shift and lift into VMs is that's still infrastructure. One of the things you lay out in the book is a different way of thinking about what it, it managing infrastructure. Um, it was very declarative. Is that what, what word would you use to, to describe uh, infrastructure as code is maybe overplayed. Um, how, how do you describe your approach to infrastructure? If, if the old way should be, long forgotten and turned into pet petroleum and pumped out of the ground. Um, in, in the book, I lay it out a couple different ways. Uh, I'm actually, we're, I'm working on, not a committee, but a, a group of people redefining uh, cloud native for the CNCF right now. We're kind of going through, because their tenants were uh, container packaged, uh, orchestrated uh, through some orchestration system and and I can't even remember the third thing, um, but they were very specific to like, you're running containers and you're doing them this way. <laughs> it was written to make Kubernetes sound like the ultimate cloud native thing. Yes. Right. And, and, and getting and into that. Adjusting that. Yeah. Yeah. There's even a in thread. If people haven't seen it, there's a thread in the uh, CNCF archives where they, they debate it and, and Justin just owned the thread. It was awesome. <laughs> um, uh, that was I, a good discussion, so. I thought about it a lot in the book and, th and that's where I, I kind of came from where I, I struggled with this for months, you know, trying to come up with these definitions. I'm like, this is on dead tree edition books. Like I can't go change this thing anymore. So I need to think about it, you know, really well. And I came away with a lot of different thoughts about, you know, making it uh, more observable, uh, more reliable. There's all these attributes that your infrastructure should have. Um, but one of the things that kind of uh, Chris and I kind of came together on with the progression through the book is uh, really the cloud native infrastructure piece of it is running your infrastructure as a bunch of applications, not as a separate thing from your applications where you have cloud native apps and those cloud native apps should also be, you should have cloud native apps that res are responsible for managing your infrastructure. And, and specifically through the reconciler pattern that is super popular in Kubernetes where it's, you know, look at current state, look at desired state and, and merge those two things together. And it's a pattern we see a lot in things like Terraform and even config management does it locally on a system. Um, that's how they kind of get to the state. You declare a state and they, they kind of make it happen. But one of the, the differences being uh, all those cases are you know, infrastructure as code where you have a static repository of text. And in this case, um, Chris really sold me on the idea of infrastructure as software, where the software is constantly doing that loop for you and, and it merges that state and it actually keeps its own state store of, of what infrastructure looks like right now as a snapshot. So, all right, so I wanna, this is gonna drive me a little bit to ask you about immutability and immutable code. Cause one of the challenges that you're describing with this state reconciler which works pretty well for Kubernetes because Kubernetes will destroy containers that aren't operating and then reset them. Doesn't necessarily apply as well for infrastructure if you're trying to assume item potency within the configuration. Because item potency is super hard, if, yes. that make, if that makes sense, right? So the idea that um, I have a state and I can keep reapplying a configuration to keep it in that state, uh, the old chef and puppet models ends up being really, really hard to get right. There's drift, there's all sorts of changes. How do you match between that sort of try and try and try and try again for, for reconciling versus I know where I'm starting from, I can get to a known point, the, immutab the immutability of infrastructure? Uh, well, some of that also that. comes from the fact that uh, you need to not, in a cloud native infrastructure, it needs to be more dynamic and you need to not need declare need to declare everything because we have auto scaling groups and we have you know dynamic named things and so like the old 
adage of, of we're declaring everything in code and we literally every character we type is what ends up in in the running infrastructure. Whereas in cases like uh, Mesos and Kubernetes, it's dynamically naming these pods and it gives you an endpoint and a load balancer, but then behind that there could be one, two, a hundred, and, and you didn't create those hundred yourself, like some other system did that for you. The software actually took over and ran that piece for you. And so there's a level of abstraction that you need to declare, but then everything else, the actual implementation of, I need this endpoint available and I need, you know, something behind it uh, kind of gets abstracted away from the code that you wrote to say, now go run this thing. So for somebody who's used to like an Ansible inventory file and a playbook, right? This seems, this is really sort of different. It's not a configuration that you're describing and then a system goes and builds the configuration. It's what you're describing as a much more interactive loop because Kubernetes is not at all like Ansible. It's not just creating a, a you know, pushing a template out there with a run and then it's done and it just, everything's just sort of sits until you push buttons again. You're describing the infrastructure as code idea, sorry, the infrastructure is software idea. Um, now that's an important distinction. So it's running software, it's maintaining, it's actively maintaining its state. It's that autonomic system, word I haven't heard in a while, but is that, a, is that where you're going? It's much more of an interactive loop where you're reasserting the state's supposed to look like this? It's an interactive loop and it's a, uh, to some degree, an uncontro uncontrolled by the user. It's abstracted away from the user. Like if I write, uh, I don't know, an a, a application on my own system uh, yeah. and I want it to run 10 threads, somewhere in there, you know, the kernel is going to schedule where those threads, you know, where they end up, what CPU cores, what order they go in. And, and that's, we're doing the same thing, but we're doing it in the infrastructure side where we say, hey, I want an endpoint and, and I want you to make sure that there's enough of them there so that I don't overload the system or, or overload the application. And, and we declare it at a much higher level instead of saying, make 10 of these and put them on these five boxes or something. So, I mean, I, that makes sense to me in a container drive system where it's where you have an abstraction and you have a, a pretty sophisticated platform that we've built under it. Can you click that down a level and, and try and create something similar, even a layer below it, where there's a much more active, you know, sort of goal seeking system behind the infrastructure? Do you, do you see it as going lower? Well, I, I definitely call it in the book that, I mean, uh, containers are not necessarily, you, know, you don't have to have containers to be cloud native. Look at what Netflix has been doing for a long time now. I mean, all their, all of Netflix's early infrastructure was immutable VMs and they ran all of their, you know, VM images in auto scaling groups. And, and again, they trusted that the group itself would scale dynamically as needed. And that auto scaling group was essentially the software handling uh, what the infrastructure looked like. They said, I want this image and you just need to make sure that there's enough CPU available and an auto scaling group did that for them. So what's an, an immutable VM would look like what? Can you just, can you break that down a little bit? The, yeah, I mean, there's always uh, little things about immutable, you know, cause there's a log <laughs> file or, or there's, a, you know, there, there's some sort of state, but it, it was essentially a, a shippable image, a, a shippable binary that they could put out somewhere and it would run and do the thing that they expected. Yes, during that process of running, like, you know, PID 17 might be different on one system versus another because of how it starts up. So there are gonna be differences between those images, but the actual binary that you ship or package that you ship is the same thing. And then you just replicate that thing over and over again. Right, and so, but that implies a, a certain CI CD pipeline that produces the images. It, it, it says that when I need to make a change to my infrastructure, I'm producing a new I image and I'm rolling that image out. I'm not trying to patch the images that I have, right? Those are, when, when I hear somebody say immutable VM or immutable infrastructure in general, those are the patterns that we're talking about. It's a, it's a, it's a tightly coupled unit and that unit is replaced as a whole unit. You're not, you know, rolling out uh, a new, you know, get pull, compile on the machine itself and rolling it. You're actually adding new machines, taking out old ones. Is that, that your understanding? Yeah, absolutely. And, and okay. that was uh, a lot of these cloud native practices 
uh, some people were like, oh, well, I, I had DevOps. I don't need DevOps anymore because I have cloud native, right? And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> they go together. Like if you do not have the DevOps practices of having these pipelines and, and immutable, you know, at least some path to promote your, your code and what you're shipping, then, then don't even try, you know, just jumping into cloud native because you're going to have to build some of that stuff first. So, I mean, the way I'm hearing it, the infrastructure as software concept and the immutability concept are very tightly connected because you're really saying, I'm going to give you an artif artifact that I'm going to count on an infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to count on a platform that abstracts my infrastructure to just run that, that, that artifact in a consistent way. And, and because it's immutable, I don't really care after I've handed off that artifact managing it. My management action is here's a new artifact, put it, you know, you know, let the black box run the artifact. Is that a, is that a fair statement? Yeah. I don't think you have, you don't necessarily have um, all the pieces in place by just having an artifact because yeah. I could, I can create an artifact and, and do all the wrong things with it. And manually go. <laughs> of course, <laughs> but yeah, the, the two hand in, you know, do go hand in hand where I can't, you know, I don't want uh, an imperative thing that I ship that says run these steps. I'm not going to, you know, do that on the, I'm not going to like, right. okay, push this bash script and then run these things and try to handle error, error correction through those steps. I want an API that I'm going to hit that's declarative. The API in the background is going to be imperative and, and handle things either through other declarative APIs or itself, you know, doing things in order. But that right. API is, is the place that I look for when errors happen. I don't need to handle all that logic on the, on the, some script that I send it. Okay. So I, I think this is a really big deal for people to understand because the, the old model of infrastructure, especially the configuration mutable style infrastructure is give me a VM and then I go configure it and then I go maintain it. And what we're seeing, especially at scale, that is a very broken model. Um, not very broken. It's, it's, it's much more complex than you would think to go back to that VM and try and sustain it and maintain it. And so you're saying, look, none of that, I, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with any, any part of that system's life cycle if I don't have to, right? SSHing into a box to troubleshoot it um, is sort of breaking the pattern. It's, it, you're ruining your abstraction. Is that a fair? And those practices are completely fine and acceptable if you don't need the scale and the speed and the agility that things like cloud native infrastructure would bring you because not everyone needs that. And if I have five servers and 20 people to manage them, guess what? Like, I don't need these practices. Like I could just say, Hey, you manage, you know, like we, yeah. we can divvy this up. But if you do get to the point, like, Hey, people don't scale indefinitely and people make mistakes. And there are all these things that uh, come into play when you say, okay, well, how do I get to market faster? How do I become more agile? How do I deploy more changes? How do I test these other things? And, and DevOps really tried to pioneer a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of times it was, DevOps focused only on the applications and infrastructure was some other thing that we handled through another means. In a lot of cases, teams adopted, you know, config management and then they're like, oh, well, config management is good, but I want Terraform because Terraform does that at a more holistic view. Whereas config management is typically, you know, one server at a time. Terraform can kind of orchestrate some of those pieces together, um, which is which is a good pattern to have. And then inside of this, you know, infrastructure as software, it's essentially like literally um, I'm actually a fan of the um, Terraform enterprise, which literally runs okay. an API of Terraform, which is infrastructure as software because you hit the Terraform enterprise API and it does that current state desired state, you know, merge the differences and make that thing happen. And it, it, I'm not saying that Terraform is the only solution for that because obviously Netflix does that and, and, mm -hmm. you know, Amazon, all these other people have these, things as well. And we're, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan, Racken in general is a fan of Terraform and what it does. I, I have, I have a little bit mixed feelings on Terraform sometimes. Um, I'm interested since you, you brought up Terraform, I'm, I'm happy to take a, a minute and do an aside. Um, what do you, you know, what gets you excited about Terraform? What's, what, what gives you angst? What's I'm interested in the, the balance, balance of fair opinion, Terraform? 
uh, I am not enough of a user of Terraform to okay. know every every piece that I would not like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I know how successful We're all operators get grumpy. <laughs> well, we love our tools, and they, they, is, it, it is that an acceptable <laughs> answer? Hold on. <laughs> oh no, he's gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna keep going. <laughs> I I know how successful it makes some people, and how much they are able to do with it, and yeah. I know that. Uh, it is a better solution than a lot of other things. And, and I mean, that the stuff that HashiCorp people do, I, I think a lot of their tools are fantastic. Um, but there's a lot of cases where, you know, it's it maybe not abstract enough from, you know, cloud providers or infrastructure, or there's not enough, there's a lot of things that's like, well, you're still kind of hard coding a lot of things in, right. in a lot of cases. So it's not completely like, write it once, run it everywhere kind of thing. And, and in, in this case, like Kubernetes is kind of bringing us that API that is available everywhere. I mean, this is the, the only, outside of VMs, the only standard you know, thing that you can get at every major cloud provider is Kubernetes, a, a hosted version of Kubernetes. It's an interesting way to put it. And then containers are portable, so you're, you're pretty well covered. In that yeah, as, as long as those Kubernetes instances are compatible with each other, which, you know, CNCF has done a lot of work on, you know, making tests and, and validating those situations and saying, yes, you are a valid Kubernetes uh, cluster, so your workload is portable from one to the other. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The, the, the comment, your comment about Terraform is the one we usually hear, which is it's not an abstraction. It's a common tool that works on multiple platforms. It's not one plan does not run in every infrastructure. And that's in, it, that the level of variation between different platforms and infrastructures, needful variation, because people do things different ways, is almost impossible to abstract in a useful way. Um, and I've watched people try, but that's, I, I, would, I would say that's, Terraform does a lot. Uh, maybe somebody will figure out the, the universal hybrid multi-cloud abstraction layer tool and, and make a ton of money. Um, I'm also not a fan of making, you know, the single hammer hit everything where I see Terraform used in a lot of cases where I don't think it's the right solution. And same thing with Ansible and config management tools. I, I see a lot of overreach because an operator is familiar with the tool and they say, oh, well, that's, I'm going to extend this to do something that it maybe shouldn't. That's so. Do you, do you think Kubernetes is going to be able to to sort of stay straight and narrow on this is what we do that we do it really well, or is there going to be a a Kubernetes expansion to do all other things too? They've definitely added a lot of extension points there. Uh, okay. That doesn't mean everyone will use them, and so I I absolutely think that people will run into problems and use it incorrectly. Um, because it's a learning curve and it's a, it's a new way of running things and it's a new way of extending and building on top of something. Uh, so I absolutely think that people will abuse those, those extension points. Um, <laughs> by, default, I, by default, yes. <laughs> yeah, but, but Kubernetes has tried to, and, and even now they're, they're taking a step back in a lot of cases and redefining the core Kubernetes and you know, what, even what objects in the API are should be part of the core Kubernetes API, things like uh, should cron jobs be there and should deployments be there and you know what does it mean what is the the very basic thing that kubernetes should have in its api and then everything else should be an extension and this is, this is where like the helm the helm project right which is not in kubernetes it's an ecosystem thing to me is a very good model for it's clearly a, a component that everybody wants to use or a lot of people want to use with kubernetes but it doesn't have to be in kubernetes it can be an ecosystem component. Yeah, Helm, uh, like, you know, uh, custom resource definitions, uh, the operator pattern for a lot of these things where those operators that run inside of Kubernetes are your infrastructure as software, where I, I can have a uh, Rook operator or a Prometheus operator, and that operator handles the scaling of this, this application that I want. And so I can define, I want a you know, a Rook cluster and, and the Rook operator will go through and actually, you know, provision the storage and, and do the, that kind of stuff for me. And it's a, it's software that's running doing this thing that I can declaratively, declaratively call and say, give me a cluster like this. And if it can't make that cluster, it'll return, the API will return an error. Even if that API is doing imperative things behind the scene, it'll know the state of the system and do reconcile loops. So, I mean, that sounds a lot like what you were talking about with cloud native infrastructure. So do you, do you consider the operator pattern part of the spectrum of cloud native infrastructure? Yes. Okay. 
yeah, yeah absolutely because so. it, it keeps a state of you know it, it can query the existing states it keeps its own you know you can tell it i want to mutate that state some way and it'll reconcile those things based on what you know is currently running what it sees in etcd inside of kubernetes or however it's storing that information so yeah so at that from that perspective you can actually take a base kubernetes infrastructure and then start expanding it into providing more and more infrastructure capability infrastructure com components um do you that to me and when, when i was reading the book one of the things that sort of stands out is is this this idea that kubernetes can become the infrastructure control plane would do you think that's a fair expectation is kubernetes with things like the operator pattern going to ultimately be able to run every component of the data center Um, every component is, <laughs> is tricky because there's still, you know, there's still PDUs and, sure. uh, things, things of that nature that Kubernetes probably doesn't care about. Um, but, uh, they've done a good job at breaking out even the, um, the cloud controller where the cloud controller, you, you spin that up in your cluster to say what cloud environment you're running in. And I'm in, I'm in Google or I'm in Amazon or I'm in Microsoft and it will provision those load balancers and disks and that kind of stuff for you. Right. And then there's the, um, uh, uh, service um, and the like another, service broker. Yeah, the service yeah. broker, which will get you other things and say, I need a database or I need, you know, some other resource. And, and so they're putting that software, whether that software has to run inside of Kubernetes, maybe not, right. but the pattern is there to have some declarative API endpoint that I call and say, I need this thing and it goes and makes it. Okay. So you could create a, a dedicated storage pool or a dedicated database infrastructure, and then the service broker could inter interface that. You're not, you're not necessarily running that database cluster on your Kubernetes cluster and cr creating these inception-like layers of control. You're, set, you're able to say, oh, okay, wait a minute, I, maybe I have a storage infrastructure where I can just put an a as an API and I can, I can create a, a, serv a broker in front of that or a service in front of that. Exactly. Yeah. The service broker doesn't have to run things inside of Kubernetes. It can connect to anything. And so you can, there's a, um, uh, an Ansible service broker. That's just literally like a bunch of Ansible playbooks that provision things based on what you ask for. And so you can write an Ansible playbook that then service broker can talk to and run and, and build something for you. It doesn't matter if it's in Kubernetes, if it's in Amazon, it could be, you know, a bunch of VMs or something else behind the scenes. Right. Okay. I, yeah, and that strikes me as one of those two levels deep, potentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you can definitely get in trouble when, you know, when some of your infrastructure is not handled the same way. And you're like, oh, well, how did all these things get created? Uh, you know, well, you can look at the API, but not everyone's going to know, look at this API, because that's what created it. There's definitely a disconnect in how some people are operating their infrastructure where, you know, half the group is SSHing in and, and doing something at a lower level, but then the rest of, you know, developers oh, yeah, are, are, are talking to these APIs that are abstracted. Right. I mean, somebody, somebody at some point does sometimes need to SSH into a server, but if it's happening, I flag should be going up somewhere um, to tell, you know. Uh, so one of the things that you had said uh, about your CNI definition that, that sort of floated by is observability. Um, and with any systems that do a lot of things for you, observability is a big, big deal. Do you want to describe what you mean by observability and then how it fits into, into it, why it's a critical component of the definition and where it fits? Yeah. Um, it's very buzzwordy to me right now. And, and I have a hard time like trying to, to, pick out the things that aren't that are meaningful. That's why I like to ask about it because yeah. I, I want to know was this real is this just monitoring with a different with uh, in a different coat. Right yeah and so and so it's it's hard to pick out what why is this different and and obviously like monitoring is a piece and you have to monitor things and and I think I like the, the way that um, Charity Majors kind of describes it where um, you get observability when like a dashboard is where you go, like where information goes to die. Like you set up this dashboard because you had a problem and now you never want that problem to happen again. But observ observability is when you can actually like, instead of just a dashboard, like you can kind of interrogate the system where you go somewhere to start asking questions. And then you can answer those questions at a higher level through log collection and distributed tracing and metrics. And all these things get pulled together where you can then say, oh, hey, you know, which systems, 
are new in the last 12 hours and which of those systems might be showing this error in the logs and and you can kind of you can really dig into the the entire infrastructure and then a observe what's going on and it's not just a this dashboard answers this question so go find a different dashboard that answers a different question you need to have a starting point to introspect all of your systems and what's actually going on uh, that's a high bar yes in in i don't know you know there's that's one of the things that I think is, is very much missing inside of like CNCF. There's no tool that does that that's open. Um, I know that Facebook has uh, scuba and, and the stuff that charity is obviously building around that um, for at Honeycomb. Uh, right. it's, it's really about making that um, debugging and, and observ observability kind of not only somewhere you can go to start asking questions, but I actually like the model of making that more of a social thing where you can view what someone else was searching when they were trying to debug something. And so it's like, if I had access to all of your batch history, it would help me a lot if I was running into the same problem. And, and so it's a similar thing where it says like, oh, well, I need to, you know, I'm having a database error. Well, let me go look at what the DB admin searched for last time. And, and it makes it a social thing and it makes it, you know, more discoverable of where I might even want to start and what questions to ask. And try, social's not the word I would have used. I, I, I appreciate the, analogy i would have i would have said team or right knowledge shared or something like that but social i i, I understand the, the context it, it's it strikes me as really important also because you it in the infrastructure software definitions you're giving there's a lot of behavior that is is automatic and so if something's happening connecting the dots right we talk about this with containers Containers are so short-lived. By the time an error, you're troubleshooting an error, the container's gone that caused the error. Um, and so it puts a whole different level of challenge in there to recreate problems, understand what's going on, collect data. Um, I'm surprised that you don't, Prometheus is not a sufficient component for that. Well, Prometheus but, is metrics, but it's, it's not necessarily, you know, I can't see log data out of it. And, and even going back to like infrastructure as software versus infrastructure as code, you know, historically I could go in and I'd have my you know, puppet manifest and I can go look in my puppet manifest and say, oh, where did this break? And I look in the code to say, oh, this if statement didn't check the right thing. So I need to update this, this code. But in, a, in cloud native, when the software is actually running the infrastructure and changing things frequently, I can't go to a static repository and say, oh, this is uh, the thing that's different because guess what? That's not the thing that's running in production right now because you have an API, you can query those de declarative APIs, but really what you care about is how the applications are performing. And if your infrastructure is managed by applications, then you also query you know, applications that look at your infrastructure. And it's not just you know, your product, wow. but it's, it's applications at both levels. And then you, one of the things you need to think about is a degree of tagging or, or information that you can thread through that to see the, how you're handling things. So it becomes very important to be able to sort of connect the dots through that full infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. You need metadata around everything to be able to tie them together and be able to, you know, search for various things because I can't just say, okay, I have a thousand VMs. I don't know what they're running, but some other API did it. It's like, no, no, no. When that API creates it, it tags those properly where it's this application, it's running these kinds of things. And Kubernetes does a great job at doing that through labels and, and you know, you can add in annotations for things and, and then you can query everything by these labels and it's similar thing for right. infrastructure. So, so as a takeaway for that, if you're using Kubernetes, you're like, I don't need to worry about these labels. Ah, oh, that's advanced. <laughs> no, you actually need to understand that that part of building your infrastructure and managing it because of the dynamism, part of observability is actually adding metadata. And maybe that's a takeaway to, to me about what you're saying about observability. There's a degree of metadata that you have to consider in this for putting things together. Um, strikes yeah, me and, that, yeah, go ahead. Anyone that's debugged a you know, Kubernetes cluster, when something's going on, the, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to use the command line to query, like, what what's running behind this label or what is this label? And and those are very obvious things that Kubernetes exposes to add that debuggability. And, and we need that at a more broader level um, in more infrastructure. And I don't think, I don't think we're there yet uh, because it's that's not necessarily a standard thing across the board where everything has, you know, not, 
Amazon has labels and Google has labels, but uh, unless you know the the same APIs are deploying all those things, you can't. It's hard to tie those things together. Yeah, people and, don't people don't think of it. It's an interesting takeaway um, for me and the stuff we do in physical that I, I want to think more deeply about is how do you continue to to create those types of pieces and the immutability to me helps you troubleshoot what you're doing because you're not talking about a, uh, an artifact that's configured in the field, right? You're actually, you're, art, you're eliminating some of the variability because you can go back to a tagged artifact and say, this is what went through the system and you can look at it and see what the issues were. Um, yeah, and tracing that back to source is super important where I can go look at what's in production and say, okay, this is the hash on it. How did that get there? Go to the build system, go to the, you know, all the way back to the code commit and say, this is the code yeah. commit and now that's a thing. And that, that falls apart if it's, out in the, if it's out in the wild getting mutated. This is so, right, I'm, I keep coming back to this because I, I think that people are like, oh, I understand immutability, but I don't think people have thought the way you have about why we're doing it, why it's important, right? Um, there's a level of, you know, sort of broader thinking into this helps us troubleshoot systems and build cloud native infrastructures and scale them and observe them that you've put together in thinking about the book, um, that even after reading the book, right, the conversation sort of peels back layers in this onion for how complex cloud native infrastructure actually is to, to think through and build correctly. Yeah, and, and back to the mutability too, it matters yeah. what you're building that's immutable because uh, an RPM is immutable, right? It's a, it's a essentially a tar that I ship out somewhere, but that RPM, you know, acts differently on different systems. It's mutating something yeah, else. Right. And so what immutable artifact do you want to ship that is the actual running thing? Because I can ship Apache in an RPM. And guess what? That Apache is the same thing that I shipped in the in the Yum repo. But that system it's running on is now different. And and so that's where like what I actually care about is the system holistically, not the individual packages on it. Right. And and time even time of day can make a difference because the repository dependencies in a repository shift right moment by moment. And so even if the even if the RPM you've shipped hasn't changed at all, it could have a dependency that gets pulled in by something else that you that broke. Um, and I, I have seen multiple uh, times that people try to just control the world and say, well, we're just going to control all of our dependencies and right. not let anything change from us. And I think that's the wrong approach to do it, where you actually need to be more flexible and just ship a bigger product, you know, at once, instead of saying, well, I ship this product that depends on these, you know, five right. RPMs. It says, no, 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 bundle all those together and now ship that one thing. You have identified one of those false efficiencies that people try to achieve which is I don't, want to I don't want to send as many bytes over the wire, so I'm just gonna send the code patch that I need to send, and then chaos ensues because of all the you know, unexpected dependency in your graph. Whereas if you shipped a bigger bundle, you would actually have faster action, more reliable action, reduced complexity. Um, and I've been guilty of that in the past, right? You, you get these false efficiencies of optimizing, you know, amount I downloaded when Today, hardly, it doesn't matter. Don't, that, don't optimize that. Optimize, you know, optimize out complexity, I think. It's yeah. One of my big it, uh, something you just briefly mentioned that I, I learned yeah. during writing the book where I realized that uh, chaos engineering and mm. specifically uh, Netflix's Simeon Army with Chaos Monkeys, that literally is infrastructure as software because it's a software application that's running that's causing these you know breakage and and doing these things where it's not a a one-time configuration oh let's just change that that little bit it's it's constantly going through all of the systems and killing things or or destroying things and it's it is a pattern of infrastructure as software it just so happens that that piece of software is destroying your infrastructure so, so in the Simian army, is there a degree of observability so that if something's breaking, you know that it was broken by the Simian army and not an actual, like an actual bug or a defect or a system outage, right? Because that observability would help you trace back the causes. And they have a lot of controls around that. They actually have a whole new okay. framework for what, how they do chaos engineering inside of Netflix. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's, uh, it's, you know, based on same primitives that they have, but much better controls around uh, when things can happen and how you kind of like opt out certain pieces or how you view what it's doing at any time, because it will automatically kind of uh, 
uh, peel things back in case, if it's going too aggressive, where it says, okay, we're only ever going to do like 5% of traffic and we're only going to do it on these times. And, and it will automatically do some of that stuff and say, hey, guess what? I already detected that I did the, the chaos monkey itself will detect if it broke something. So it's okay. constantly running tests against the infrastructure and saying, I'm changing this. Let me run all these tests and see if anything's broken. And, and, you know, it can, it can scale up or down from there and say, okay, nothing's broken yet. I'm going to keep going. Let me run these tests. And then as soon as it does detect, oh, I broke something, the, the software itself will scale back and put it back to how it was. And then mm. essentially send a report and say, hey, guess what? When I, you know, 10 of these instances died, this is the latency that I got, which was over our threshold for, uh, you know, for, for this API or something. And, and that's, it's a, a pattern of uh, continual testing of your infrastructure, of your run, running infrastructure. It's not you know, unit tests, it's, it's not just testing the code, but it's actually testing the running infrastructure. So what you're describing to me sounds a lot like what Google described in the SRE book. Um, do, you, do you see, and, and I, we, this, is a, this would be a whole other hour topic, and, and, and I know Stephen's giving me the stink eye because we need to wind it up, but I, I, you know, can you offer an insight on, on is this SRE, does SRE, do you care about the, the term SRE, Site Reliability Engineering? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's a, a really good um, practice and a set of whole like uh, thing around how you manage, uh, how you get to be uh, highly efficient. And, and I kind of broke it down in my head where um, DevOps was a lot about uh, making empathy between two teams that were kind of at odds with each other. Whereas, you know, operations and, and developers, they were trying to do different things and we're going to build empathy by making them do the same thing together. We're operate, you know, operations does development and development carries pagers and we kind of build empathy that way. Whereas SRE is, is in my opinion, more about uh, getting rid of the opposition and just making everyone a developer. You say, okay, we now manage all of our infrastructure as developers. And guess what? Now you all speak the same language. You all are trying to do the things, same things. You're trying to make changes frequently, but you're trying to do it with this stability in mind. And SRE is really about the practice of building empathy between the teams by getting rid of team differences. I really like that way to think about it. But is that real, Justin? I mean, I get what it's <laughs> supposed to be. Um, maybe it's, it's the wrong question to ask, but is it real? I mean, are, are, are they doing it? I, I, I take a weird approach because I'm a long time old developer. I don't write anymore. But trying to think about developers doing operation stuff flips me out. When would just the last place in the world you want to put me is next to real production hardware. <laughs> <laughs> there there's definitely a level of controls that need to be built into the system to allow you know this this you know developers to just kind of do what they want uh so there's controls and there's systems around it but again back to what rob was saying earlier like having a a pipeline to actually deploy code changes and having a pipeline to deploy to deploy infrastructure changes you know builds in some of those controls and and helping to make the systems more reliable and but every time i talk to someone that you know worked at Google or is an SRE or something on, the, on those lines, they are developers first and they just happen to manage different applications from, you know, that are, that aren't user facing necessarily. They are, their, their users are internal developers deploying applications. So they're just one level below, but they're still absolutely developers. They are not operations, you know, maintaining stability, doing all these things. They're, they're tackling a, a different set of applications, and, but doing it the same way. And their developers own, and I think this is good practice in general, own the, you know, still own their applications in production to an extent, right? Since you're doing CI, CD, your check-in at, at 9 a.m. is going to be in production by lunch, and you'd better be ready for that to have caused a problem, and you're responsible for that, that action, right? I mean, developers are operators in that sense also. Yeah, and even, I mean, looking at SREs, like how Google hires an SRE, the SRE literally comes out of the developer headcount for the application. And so if, if a team wants an SRE, they give up one of their developers, whether it was, you know, a position they had or an opening or something like that, but they lose headcount to have someone man maintain the system as an SRE. <laughs> oh, that's really they, they shift, they shift headcount. I'm going yeah. to argue on the lose. <laughs> shift headcount. Shift headcount. Well, Robin, Robin, Justin, I do have to stop because that's, I think that's pretty much my big job here is, uh, is stop. <laughs> this is romance. A, no. a great, a great conversation. 
Uh, Justin, again, we'll promote uh, your cloud native book for O'Reilly. And any other way uh, people can find you, maybe a blog, uh, social media, something like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter. I go as uh, Rothgar on Twitter. Um, I have a blog if you go to justingarrison.com. Um, I'll be giving a, a talk at the Southern California Linux Expo next month. It's actually a couple weeks away um, on cloud native infrastructure. So I'll be there. Uh, I'm occasionally at some you know other conferences and stuff, but usually I'm, I'm just on Twitter. I'm in a lot of the uh, CNCF and Kubernetes uh, Slack channels. So you kind of find me there as well. Okay. Well, great. Well, thanks to both of you for another great podcast. And uh, Justin, I, I think certainly we'll have to bring you again soon because I think we covered about a fifth of the questions. <laughs> we didn't even talk bare metal. Edge, yep. one of our normal favorites. Oh, we didn't even talk edge. I mean, this not very many podcasts can get by without having to find edge. <laughs> I, I didn't warn you. Well, thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. We'll talk again soon. Yep. Thank thanks. you.